Romans had never witnessed a triumphal procession quite like this. Returning to Italy from Greece in AD 67, the Emperor Nero landed at Rome and had part of the city wall torn down to signal his glorious feats. Then he made his way to Rome and entered the capital in the same chariot that had been used earlier by Augustus to celebrate victory. But Nero was no conventional conqueror. As indicated by the Olympic wreath around his brow, he had prevailed not in battle but in a host of athletic and artistic contests in Greece, where obliging judges had awarded him a phenomenal 1,808 prizes and confirmed his inflated opinion of himself as a great and versatile performer, master of stage, circus, and arena. In truth, the results said little about the virtue of his performances. At Olympia, for instance, he had competed in a chariot race driving a ten-horse team, a stunt he himself once derided. Most charioteers of the day drove four-horse teams, and even that demanded great strength and agility. Predictably, Nero's attempt ended in failure. After falling from his chariot and being helped back in, he quit the race before reaching the finish line. The judges deferred to his majesty and declared him the judges deferred to his majesty and declared him the winner nonetheless. Nero's victories may have been contrived, but his passion for performing was genuine. As a youngster, he had followed closely the exploits of the leading charioteers. Once, a teacher caught him neglecting his studies to tell fellow pupils of a driver who fell during a race and was caught in the reins and dragged along Nero by tried his team. to lie his way out of trouble Nero by claiming that he had actually been Hector, discussing the Trojan hero actually been discussing the Trojan hero to something Hector, similar in Homer's who was Iliad. Subjected to something similar the young in emperor Iliad. was equally fascinated the by young the spellbinding gifts of actors and singers and sought the strength of his voice and singers and sought the strength of his voice with a heavy stone on his lying on his back with a heavy stone on his chest. He loved staging bizarre spectacles. He loved once staging hundreds of men of high rank and once fight each other hundreds in the of men arena. of high rank to fight each other in the arena. Aristocratic Romans despised Nero for such displays and for condescending to compete in chariot races and perform on the stage himself, activities considered fit only for people of low origins. Common people, on the other hand, appreciated Nero's showmanship and readily celebrated his Olympian feats. Fittingly, the triumphal procession he staged after returning from Greece passed through the Circus Maximus, the vast racetrack in Rome where charioteers vied for glory, then continued on through the Forum. Nero was showered with ribbons and other tokens of esteem, and animals were sacrificed along the route to honor the occasion. Afterward, Nero draped his sleeping quarters with his victory reeds and commissioned statues of himself singing and playing the lyre. During the months to come, he grew increasingly concerned about straining his precious voice. It never occurred to him that he ought to refrain from singing or even sing a little less, Suetonius commented in his unsparing chronicle of Nero's reign. Instead, the emperor arrested his voice by addressing his troops only in writing or through a spokesman, and he attended no official ceremonies without a voice trainer at his side to tell him when to spare his vocal cords and when to protect his mouth with a handkerchief. It said much about Nero and his times that he considered military and administrative matters of less consequence than the pleasures of the stage or circus. His tendency to worry more about his artistic performances than about his role as supreme commander would soon come back to haunt him. Many Romans shared his passion for games, however, and the empire appeared none the worse for it, in part because the provinces were so productive. Grain from abroad nourished the capital, and foreign recruits ably defended distant frontiers, allowing Romans to devote a considerable amount of time to revelry. By Nero's reign, roughly eighty days a year were devoted to ludi, or games, including chariot races, blood sports, and theatrical shows. In addition, emperors proclaimed special celebrations to mark victories or other great events during their reigns. Not all business came to a halt on these festive occasions, but for as long as the games lasted, the main task of Romans was to enjoy themselves. Common people had further reason to cherish the games, because the gatherings brought them in touch with their leaders and made them feel privileged. 
Rulers who hoped to endear themselves to the masses had little choice but to stage lavish entertainments. Julius Caesar spent extravagantly on games to bolster his reputation, and Roman emperors in later times were no less generous in their outlays. The satirist Juvenal scoffed at the masses for their obsession with bread and circuses doled out to them. Yet the games were more than mere diversions. They were meant to honor the gods, and though they lost much of their spiritual significance over time, they remained important civic rituals, celebrating the strength and competitiveness that made Rome great. Chariot racing was the oldest and most popular of the public entertainments. According to legend, Romulus organized the day of chariot racing soon after he founded Rome. The original Circus Maximus, located in a swampy valley between the Aventine and Palatine hills, was reportedly laid out in the days of the Etruscan kings. The great Circus Maximus of imperial times, however, was the work of Julius Caesar, who began the reconstruction, and of Augustus, who completed it. Later emperors added embellishments, including more seating and an increasingly elaborate facade graced with shops and arcades. There were other circuses in Rome and around the empire, but none surpassed the Circus Maximus. Measuring 680 yards long and 150 yards wide, it seated roughly 150,000 spectators, or three times as many as the Colosseum, the main amphitheater in Imperial Rome for blood sports, and many more fans settled for standing room or watched from the hills overlooking the circus. To be assured of a seat, people began arriving before dawn. The lower tier was designated for senators and equestrians. Others were relegated to the upper tiers, where the seating was particularly cramped and uncomfortable. Many spectators brought cushions. The crowded conditions had at least one advantage, however. Ovid, a poet celebrated for his love lyrics, noted approvingly that his suitor could hardly avoid touching his female companion as they sat side by side at the races, and he could win her gratitude by asking the man behind her not to jab her in the back with his knees. A day at the races began with a parade through the streets of Rome to the circus. Traditionally, the presiding magistrate led the way in his chariot, accompanied by attendants and followed by musicians. Then came the stars of the event, the charioteers themselves, carefully guiding their spirited horses through the narrow streets. Behind them trailed priests and incense bearers, along with the images of gods and goddesses, carried aloft on biers or in chariots. The spectators might root for a particular charioteer, but they were mainly attached to the faction the driver and horses belonged to. There were four such factions in all, the greens, red, blues, and whites, and each had its own racing colors, stables, trainers, grooms, and zealous fans. A foul by a member of one faction against another could spark a riot in the stands. Pliny the Younger, a prominent orator and public official, professed disdain for the frenzy of the spectators and gave thanks that their pleasure is not mine. But he may have enjoyed the sport more than he let on. He wore a signet ring bearing the image of a chariot and team. Fans had plenty to get worked up about because drivers often tried to maneuver their opponents into crashes. Fallen drivers, having tied the reins around their waists to give them better control of the horses, might be dragged to their deaths if they could not cut themselves loose in time with the dagger they wore at their waist. One of the best accounts of the drama and danger of chariot racing was offered by the poet Sidonius Apollinaris, who wrote in the 5th century AD but described a contest that was not unlike those run at the circus in Nero's time. Apollinaris told of a race in which his friend Consentius competed, involving four four-horse teams that could be clearly identified in the starting gates by their colors, white, blue, green, and red. In the tense moments before the race, grooms tried to calm the nervous horses with soothing pats and soft words, but the animals still stamped and snorted. When the starter gave the signal, trumpets blared and the four teams charged from the gates raising clouds of dust. Consentius held his horses back for six laps and let the other drivers vie for the lead. Then, as he made for the far turn in the seventh and final lap, he planted his feet firmly on the floorboard and urged his team on. One driver had already exhausted his horses and pulled out. A second felt Consentius closing in on him, trying to make too sharp a turn at the post and spun out of control. The third driver took too wide a turn, allowing Consentius to pass him on the inside, then cut back sharply in an effort to catch up 
and fell to his death when his horses stumbled and his chariot overturned. Safely ahead, Consentius drove on alone to the finish line and received the coveted palm branch of victory. Despite the hazards of the sport, some drivers enjoyed long and successful careers. Gilded busts of leading charioteers adorned public places, and rulers befriended the champions and lavished them with gifts. The Emperor Caligula reportedly gave 20,000 gold pieces to a driver for the Greens, his favorite faction. Such tribute must have been dizzying for the charioteers, many of whom began their careers as slaves. Their regular earnings went to their owners, who typically rewarded the driver with a portion of the purse. In time, a gifted charioteer might purchase his freedom and negotiate for better terms from the faction owners. To some Romans, the sums paid to charioteers appeared excessive. Juvenile complained that a driver might earn 100 times more than a lawyer, but charioteers faced great risks and many died before achieving freedom or fame. Among the greatest drivers was a man of Spanish birth named Gaius Apuleius Diocles, whose remarkable career was detailed in an inscription in Rome. Diocles came there as a youth and began racing for the Whites in A.D. 122 when he was 18 years old. Such were the challenges of the sport that it took him two years to win his first race, but he was spectacularly successful thereafter, and his services were soon coveted by other factions. He switched to the Greens in A.D. 128 and moved to the Reds a few years later, remaining with them for the rest of his career. A great driver like Diocles eventually achieved a kind of free agency and could choose which faction to race for. By the time Diocles retired at the age of 42, after nearly a quarter century in competition, he had won an astonishing 1,462 races of the 4,257 he entered, many of them involving two or three teams from each of the four factions. In more than half his victories, he led from start to finish, but when pressed, he outdueled his competitors and won more than 500 races in the closing stretch. Like the great jockeys of later times, he had fine horses to work with and drove one stalwart animal to victory 200 times. In an era when a Roman legionary earned about 1,200 sesteres a year, Diocles garnered 36 million sesteres in prize money over his career. Part of that went to the faction owners, but he still must have been enormously wealthy. Diocles was a perfect role model for a society that worshipped victory. In the circus, as in battle or politics, Romans could do just about anything to gain an edge. Fans even cast spells on the rivals of their favorites. I conjure you up, holy beings and holy names, read the inscription on one cursed tablet. Join in aiding this spell, and bind, enchant, thwart, strike, overturn, conspire against, destroy, kill, even break, Icarus, the charioteer, and all his horses tomorrow in the circus at Rome. For all the perils faced by charioteers, men who did battle in the arena confronted even greater risks. About the best they could hope for was to match the feats of gladiator Severus, a slave who won his freedom by fighting. What became of him is unknown, but a portrait in Pompeii showed him vanquishing a foe in his 55th bout, a long career for a man in his perilous trade. From the beginning, there was something sacrificial about the gladiator's role. There are contests known as munera, or obligations, derived from Etruscan rites designed to honor dead heroes with displays of courage and bloodshed. The first documented ritual of this kind at a Roman funeral was held in 264 BC and involved three pairs of gladiators, all of them slaves. Soon Roman families were staging bouts with many more contestants, both to honor the dead and gain prestige. By early imperial times, the contests had lost their religious significance and become public entertainments, staged on their own or in conjunction with chariot races and other spectacles during festivals. The emperor sometimes served the sponsor and host in Rome, and local dignitaries often played that role elsewhere. Bouts in the arena between gladiators were often supplemented by venationes, or wild animal hunts, pitting leopards, lions, elephants, crocodiles, and other imported beasts against one another or against humans. Unarmed or armed, a separate class of fighters, the bestiari, were trained and equipped to combat animals. 
At the grand opening of the Colosseum in A.D. 80, Titus sponsored 100 days of carnage involving more than 10,000 fighting men and hordes of animals, 9,000 of which perished. Amphitheaters like the Colosseum were built especially for the staging of such bloodfests. Previously, the shows had been held in circuses, forums, and other public places which proved dangerous for spectators. At one show, frightened elephants nearly stampeded into the crowd. To protect against mishaps, the lowest seats in the Colosseum were situated well above the killing ground, and the animals were kept securely caged before the events in underground cells, where they must have raised an infernal din. Located near the Colosseum was one of the training schools where gladiators learned their craft. Severus, probably trained at the school in Pompeii, considered one of the best. Like soldiers, trainees sparred with weapons that were heavier than those used in actual combat. The prospects of would-be gladiators might be bleak, but the owners kept the men strong and fit, providing them with good doctors. The great Greek physician Galen began his career treating gladiators in the mid-2nd century AD and later became the court doctor of the emperor Marcus Aurelius. Severus fought in the Pompeii Amphitheater, the oldest surviving structure of its kind, completed around 80 BC, with seats for 20,000 spectators, or enough to hold the entire population of Pompeii, along with visitors from nearby communities. Sometimes the violence in the arena spilled into the stands. In AD 59, fighting broke out between Pompeians and fans from Nuceria, a neighboring town. The Nucerians were badly outmatched and many were killed. To discourage further rowdiness, the Roman Senate exiled the individuals who started the riot and closed the Pompeii Amphitheater for ten years, a severe punishment for the town's fervent fans. Seating at the Pompeii Amphitheater, as at other arenas, was arranged by rank. City officials and other prominent citizens occupied the lowest rows, and average citizens sat higher up. Women had to sit in the very top rows, but they could still root vociferously for their heroes, some of whom were prized as much for their good looks as for their fighting skills. Salatus the Thracian makes all the girls sigh, read one tribute to a gladiator scribbled on a wall in Pompeii. On sunny days, canvas awnings were pulled out over the seats, a convenience touted in advertisements for upcoming contests. One notice in Pompeii promised bouts between gladiators as well as the wild animal hunt and added that the awnings will be used. Often the sponsors threw a banquet for the gladiators on the night before the fights with the public looking on. Some fighters ate sparingly, hoping to remain alert and agile for the ordeal ahead. Others gorged themselves, fearing perhaps that this might be their last meal. The next day, the gladiators donned purple and gold cloaks and paraded into the amphitheater to the cheers of the spectators. Valets followed the fighters, carrying their weapons. To help excite the crowd for the duels that followed, men sometimes staged mock fights with wooden swords. Often, however, the appetite of the spectators had already been whetted by a morning of wild animal shows. Some of those bloody preliminaries were close contests, as when a lion was pitted against a tiger, for example or a man wielding a lance faced a raging bull. But other such events were mere slaughters. Unarmed criminals or captives were tied to stakes and ravaged by wild beasts, or animals were destroyed by archers from a safe distance. The demands for beasts in the arena decimated populations of wild animals in the provinces. As early as 50 BC, when Cicero was serving as governor of Cilicia in Asia Minor, he sarcastically informed a friend who wanted panthers shipped to Roman arenas that the few panthers left in his province had grown so wary of trappers that they had absconded for a neighboring land. The merciless animal shows sometimes lacked suspense and left spectators dazed rather than thrilled. At one event Cicero attended, large numbers of elephants were slaughtered. The spectators, while duly impressed, showed no real enjoyment, he noted. In fact, a certain sympathy arose for the elephants, and a feeling that there was large a kind of affinity of between that slaughtered. large animal and the human race. Large numbers the historian of Tacitus were slaughtered. reported a similar response to the mass execution of Christians by Nero, who tried to deflect rumors of his own involvement in the great fire that ravaged Rome in AD 64 by blaming members of that young sect. Nero made a spectacle of their deaths, dressing some of them in animal skins and exposing them to dogs, but according to Tacitus, the bloodfest aroused only pity for the victims. However they felt about wild animal shows, many Romans relished bouts between gladiators because they involved real skill and high drama. 
Attendants raked the sand to remove blood stains before each match and periodically sprayed scented water over the crowd. Many contests pitted one type of fighter against another. A Samnite, for example, equipped with a short sword and an oblong shield, might do battle with a Thracian, carrying a scimitar and a round shield. Or a Murmillo, wearing a helmet with a prominent fish crest, dueled with sword and shield against a bareheaded Retarius, armed with a net, a trident, and a dagger. Trumpeteer signaled the start of the match, and the deadly dance that followed was accompanied by the piping of flutes, the rattle of drums, and the lugubrious tones of a water organ. Each time a gladiator fell, the trumpet sounded anew and the crowd roared. To ensure that the men put up a good fight, an instructor stood by yelling, Strike! and Slay! and brandishing a whip or a hot iron to enforce his commands. Although the fighting was furious, it was not always fatal. Some matches ended in a draw, and a faltering fighter was often given a chance to appeal for mercy by casting aside his weapons and raising his left hand in supplication. His fate rested in the hands of the presiding host, usually the emperor himself at the Colosseum. But even the emperor was expected to defer to the opinion of the crowd, who put their thumbs up or down to signal their verdict. Spectators often spared combatants who fought bravely but condemned those who ran from their opponents or groveled for mercy. We hate those weak and suppliant gladiators, wrote Cicero, who, hands outstretched, beseech us to let them live. If the verdict was death, the winner performed the execution promptly, and the body was removed by attendants through a gate for the dead. Then the emperor rewarded the victor, often in the form of silver dishes brimming with gold pieces. As with the charioteers, part if not all of the winnings went to the gladiator's owner. An inscription in Pompeii recorded the results of one day at the arena. In nine matches involving eighteen gladiators, three losers died in defeat, the other six escaped with their lives. Fans were naturally reluctant to condemn one of their favorites simply because he had had a bad outing now and then. Severus, for example, won thirteen matches before losing to a gladiator named Albinus. Evidently, the spectators felt he had earned a reprieve, and he justified their faith in him by resuming his winning ways. Most gladiators were forced into the arena, having been raised as slaves, captured in battle, or condemned as criminals. Occasionally, impoverished freedmen signed on as gladiators for a fixed term. A few women fought as well, but largely as novelties. Slaves were freed from the obligation to continue fighting by earning the coveted rudis, a wooden sword granted to gifted gladiators at the whim of the emperor or presiding official. But the lure of the arena was strong for successful gladiators, and some who were free to leave stayed on. Despite the lowly origin of most gladiators, some men of high rank envied their feats and freely entered the arena themselves. One of Nero's predecessors, Caligula, enjoyed trading blows with professional gladiators in practice sessions, although the fighters themselves must have dreaded the bouts. It was said that during one match, Caligula's sparring partner, armed with only a wooden sword, fell down on purpose so that the emperor could claim a win, whereas Caligula drew a dagger and stabbed him to death. Caligula's fondness for fighting was tame compared to that of Commodus, who reigned toward the end of the second century AD. Some found it hard to believe that he was the natural son of Marcus Aurelius, a philosophical ruler who disliked blood sports. By one account, Commodus was conceived after his mother, Faustina, fell violently in love with a gladiator she glimpsed from a distance. The worried Marcus Aurelius reportedly consulted soothsayers who told him that this gladiator should be killed and that Faustina should bathe in his blood and afterwards lie with her husband. When this advice had been followed, the empress's passion was in fact spent, but she brought into the world Commodus, who was more of a gladiator than a prince. Whatever the origins of Commodus's enthusiasm for fighting, it grew into a mania. Before he was assassinated at the age of 31 in AD 192, the emperor reportedly dueled against more than a thousand opponents and won every time, for no one dared to defeat him. He never seriously harmed his opponents in public competition, but in private bouts at his home, according to one of his contemporaries, the senator and historian Dio Cassus, Commodus killed or maimed more than a few of his foes, slicing off the noses of some, the ears of other, and sundry features of still others. The emperor also liked to participate in the slaughter of wild animals, downing as many as a hundred bears at a time from the safety of a platform. He modeled himself after Hercules, the slayer of beasts, and, like his hero, sported a lion skin and a club. 
Senators were summoned to watch him perform in the arena and had to hail him in unison. Thou art Lord, and thou art first, they proclaimed on cue, of all men most fortunate, victor thou art. At times they found it hard to keep a straight face. Once, when Commodus severed the head of an ostrich and raised it triumphantly, Dio Cassius and other onlookers picked bitter laurel leaves from their garlands and chewed them furiously to keep from erupting in laughter, an outburst that could have been fatal. The antics of deluded rulers were not the only theatrical performances in town. Romans had a gift for satire and mimicry and expressed that talent in stage shows that were farcical, frenetic, and hugely popular. Rome also nurtured some serious playwrights, but they had difficulty competing for public attention even in the simpler days of the Republic, when the taste for lavish spectacles was not yet fully developed. Terence, a writer of the 2nd century BC who composed artful comedies and elegant verse inspired by Greek drama, did his best to keep his audience from being distracted by less sophisticated forms of entertainment. For the third production of his play, The Mother-in-Law, he wrote a wry prologue in which the producer walked on stage to introduce the drama and urge spectators not to flee the theatre for simpler treats. At the first production of the play, the producer complained, crowds had gathered nearby to watch boxers compete and a tightrope walker perform, and the resulting commotion forced the actors off the stage before the play was finished. At the second performance, he added, the audience heard that some gladiators were about to perform elsewhere and flew off in a rush to see blood spilled. The producer begged the audience to hear the actors out this time. Don't allow, by your neglect, music and drama to fade away, appreciated only by a few. Despite such urgings, classical drama lost out in the competition for spectators. In imperial times, plays of literary sophistication like the tragedies written by Nero's tutor Seneca were usually recited before private gatherings of wealthy and well-educated Romans. Most people favored shows of greater visual appeal. Many of the productions had no dialogue at all, relying instead for dramatic effect on the gestures of the actors. Nearly as popular as such pantomimes were the mime plays, whose success often had as much to do with the ingenious scenic effects as with the clever lines the actors spoke. Some of these productions dealt with mythological themes and others addressed the misadventures of stock characters, lovesick youths, knavish slaves, boastful soldiers, miserly old men, and shrewish wives. More days were devoted to such shows during games than to chariot races or gladiatorial bouts. According to the Roman historian Livy, the first theatrical performances in the capital were staged in 364 B.C. in an attempt to please the gods and bring an end to a plague. In later times, Romans continued to honor the gods theatrically by parading an eagle representing Jupiter or a dove representing Venus from the temple to the theater. As at the circuses and amphitheaters, spectators arrived early for the performances and stayed late since one show might follow another throughout the day. To accommodate the eager multitudes, Romans built large theaters. Some early structures, constructed wholly or partly of wood, held as many as 20,000 spectators. Pompey's Theater, a durable structure of stone dedicated in 55 BC, had at least 10,000 seats. Given the scale of these buildings, it was no wonder that Nero tried to strengthen his voice for the stage. The permanent stone theaters were semicircular in shape, with a crowded stage. The permanent stone theaters were semicircular in shape, with a covered stage. Dignitaries sat up front and common people farther back, but the seating rules were sometimes defied. In 41 BC, a group of soldiers threatened the future Emperor Augustus after he ordered one of their comrades arrested for daring to sit near the front. Theatergoers were entranced by wondrous backdrops and special effects, ghosts emerging from trap doors and gods supported by artfully disguised cranes soaring across the heavens. But not all the thrills were make-believe. Perhaps to compete with chariot races or wild animal shows, those who sponsored the performances sometimes transformed theaters into circuses. In one production, extras rode horses across the stage to dramatize the sacking of a city. In another, 600 mules stole the show. Some sponsors went further and imitated the bloodshed in the arena by arranging for criminals or captives to be sacrificed on stage. At the end of one show, 
the victim portraying Hercules was burned to death. In another grisly climax that may have been either accidental or planned, a man playing the part of Icarus, the mythical figure who flew too close to the sun on wings of wax, plunged to his death, splattering blood on Nero as he watched. In the theater, as in the arena, spectators were free with their opinions, sometimes waving their handkerchiefs or the flaps of their togas to express approval. They could be just as effusive with their criticisms, however, occasionally booing players off the stage with yells of, Bring on the Bears. Sponsors tried to stifle such outbursts by paying people to lead applause at their plays, no matter how dismal the performance. Such rhythmic clapping could be quite appealing, more so, perhaps, than the show itself. For all the tricks and stunts, success in the theater still rested on the ability of the performers to stir the emotions of their audience. Even the wordless art of pantomime required great eloquence on the actor's part. In some shows, a single pantomimist, one who imitates everything, supported by a chorus and musicians, played the parts of all the characters. Their hands demand and promise, wrote the Roman orator Quintilian of the great pantomime artists. They summon and dismiss... To suggest illness, they imitate the doctor feeling the patient's pulse. To indicate music, they spread their fingers in the fashion of a lyre. Pantomime shows were essentially dances. Apuleius, a writer of the 2nd century A.D., described one such exotic performance in his fictional work, The Golden Ass. The drama represented the judgment of Paris, who had to choose among three goddesses, Juno, Minerva, and Venus, and award the golden apple to the most beautiful. Venus appeared before Paris naked, Apuleius writes, except for a silk scarf that covered or rather shaded her quite remarkable hips, and which an inquisitive wind mischievously either blew aside or sometimes pressed clingingly against her. Two groups of women represented the graces and the seasons joined her on stage, scattering flowers and dancing around her to the sweet tunes of flutes. Venus then moved forward, swaying gently, and answering the tender sound of the flutes with her delicate movements. Thoroughly entranced, Paris granted her the prize. Although female roles were traditionally played by men wearing wigs and makeup or masks, there were more than a few women on stage by imperial times. They might be touted for their talent and beauty, but they were still considered disreputable, as were their male counterparts. Most actors were either freedmen or slaves. Some won freedom and fame through their talents, but those who rose too high might come crashing back to earth like the fabled Icarus. The celebrated actor Nestor, for example, was executed along with Messalina, the third wife of Clodius, after the emperor learned that Nestor had served as an accomplice to Messalina in her affair with another man. Another vaunted actor named Paris was stalked and killed in the street by Domitian after that emperor found that his wife was in love with the performer. Women who took to acting and were derided as prostitutes were simply following in the footsteps of their notorious brethren. At least one well-to-do woman named Umidia Quadratilla was so enamored of the theater that she purchased a troupe of performers and hired them out to festival organizers. Other wealthy Romans enjoyed popular drama as much as she did, but it was unusual for an aristocratic woman to At least one well-to-do in the woman named Quadratilla Umidia was a widow, however, and she needed something to fill her idle hours, which were largely devoted to At least to the one well-to-do woman named Umidia Quadratilla. Her theatrical so career was the described theater. by Pliny the Younger in a letter written after at her least death one well to do woman named Umidia Quadratilla. Pliny considered her so enamored with the, the theater that she and purchased and indulged the troops unsuitable for a lady of her high festival organizers. But he gave her credit for not exposing her <clears> grandson, a handsome and morally upright young man called Quadratus, who grew up at in her least home one to well to do woman named Umidia Quadratus Quadratilla never watched was performances so either the theater, in the theater or at home, a nor did she insist on it, them Pliny wrote. Festival organizers. Whenever Quadratilla hosted her players, he added, Pliny considered he sent her, her grandson the out troop. of the room to study. An indulgence Only once, for shortly before his grandmother's position. death, did Quadratus see a performance of her troupe. Pliny attended the show with him. People who were nothing to Quadratilla were running to the theater to pay their respects to her, he wrote though respect is hardly the word used for their fawning attentions. Jumping up and clapping to show their admiration, and then copying every gesture of their mistress with snatches of song. Pliny, a noted public figure, could scarcely imagine what it meant to Quadratilla to receive such recognition, even from lowly actors and their fans. He seemed pleased that she bequeathed the bulk of her estate to her grandson and left her theatrical retainers only a tiny bequest as gratuity for their hired applause.
The disapproval that Pliny expressed for Quadratilla's venture was nothing compared to the contempt aristocratic Romans felt for Nero when he took to the stage. Perhaps Nero's compulsive showmanship was an attempt to overcome the insecurity he felt as a young man, thrust into power at the age of sixteen, and manipulated by his elders, and particularly his scheming mother, Agrippina, and his exacting tutor, Seneca. By garnering prize after prize for his performances, Nero tried to show that he could stand on his own and command esteem, yet the victories rang hollow, and no amount of contrived applause slaked his hunger for approval. Surprisingly, for a ruler who was virtually assured of winning any competition he entered, Nero suffered from stage fright and dreaded criticism. Before every performance, he would address the judges with the utmost deference, saying that he had done what he could and that the issue was now in fortune's hands, Suetonius related. Some of the judges urged him not to worry, but others were too embarrassed to speak, and he mistook their silence for alienation and disfavor. Once, while acting in a competition, he dropped his scepter and almost gave up, fearing disqualification. But the accompanist, who was playing the flute as he performed, reassured him by claiming that the slip had passed unnoticed because the audience were listening with such rapt attention. So tender was Nero's self-esteem that no one could leave the theater while he was performing, however great the emergency. Pregnant women reportedly remained in their seats after the onset of labor and gave birth there. Men nearly bored to death feigned the real thing and were carried out for burial. It was largely the upper classes who suffered such travails and worse under Nero. He remained popular with the lower classes and may have felt for a while that the hostile aristocrats were no threat. After all, members of the senatorial order yielded far less power in Rome than they once had, but they remained a force to be reckoned with, particularly in their capacity as provincial governors and commanders. In time, Nero became the target of conspiracies involving Romans of high rank. In A.D. 66, after the discovery of one such plot, he had three commanders of senatorial rank killed. Two years later, Nero's fate was sealed when provincial leaders took arms against him, first in Gaul and later in Spain and Africa. Ultimately, Suetonius reported, the prefect of Nero's guard deserted him and he lost hope. A Roman in his position was expected to die by his own hand, but Nero found it hard to follow the script. In desperation, he called for a gladiator named Spiculus to come up and put an end to him, but neither Spiculus nor anyone else wanted to play the part of executioner. After taking refuge in the home of his freedman Phaon, Nero learned to his horror that the Senate had declared him a public enemy fit to be punished in ancient style, which meant being stripped naked and flogged to death with rods. How ugly and vulgar my life has become, Nero lamented. Finally, with the help of his secretary, he managed to stab himself fatally in the throat. Shortly before his death, Nero tearfully expressed regret that his enemies, in driving him to suicide, were depriving society of so great an artist. He believed that the Roman theater would never see his like again, and in a sense he was right. But the games went on without him, and Rome remained great on the world stage in a way that transcended the feats or follies of any single performer.